Hello and welcome to 7 Days of Science, your weekly source for the latest science news. In the headlines this week, a new species of giant megaraptor from the end of the age of dinosaurs has been discovered in South America. A million year old human skull has some interesting implications for the evolution of our species. Scientists find that the early Earth was a dry place until another planet collided with it, and much more. Our top story this week is the announcement that paleontologists have uncovered a new species of massive megaraptor in South America. The megaraptors are a particularly fascinating lineage of predatory dinosaurs. Not only does the group have a very cool name, but they also have some pretty awesome anatomy, possessing enlarged arms and highly flexible hands, upon which they have some very big claws. The megaraptors have so far only been found in rocks dating to the Cretaceous period in Asia, Australia and South America. The classification of this group has been highly contentious too. It was once thought they might be related to well-known carnivorous dinosaurs such as Allosaurus, but more recent research suggests a closer link with the Tyrannosaurs. Under this new interpretation, Megaraptors would be classified within the superfamily Tyrannosauridae, and so would not have been that distantly related to the Tyrannosauridae family, which includes T. rex. This would be a particularly intriguing evolutionary development because it implies that while the northern hemisphere saw the rise of tyrannosaurids, which grew to immense sizes but with smaller arms, the southern hemisphere witnessed the ascent of larger megaraptors that also had enlarged forearms and claws. Two very different evolutionary paths for giant carnivals that shared a not too distant common ancestry. This new megaraptor species discovered in central Patagonia comes from rock sequences that place it right at the very end of the Cretaceous period, approximately 70 to 67 million years ago, almost at the termination of the age of dinosaurs. Named Joaquin Raptor Carcili, it's known from a fair amount of the skeleton, which is excellent news since megaraptor fossils have generally been quite incomplete so far. The bones known for the new species include a partial skull, ribs, some vertebrae, hind limbs and forelimbs, with a very nice claw preserved from digit 2. This Joaquin raptor specimen is estimated to have measured about 7 metres in length, or over 23 feet, and it doesn't appear to have been fully grown yet either. Another interesting aspect of this new find is what was preserved between the jaws of the megaraptor. The dentaries, the bones that make up the lower jaws, are still closely associated with each other, and between them is a humerus from a crocodiliform. How this crocodiliform arm bone ended up there remains unclear. It could be a coincidence, perhaps moved by water currents after both animals died. However, it is tempting to interpret this as evidence of Joaquin Raptor's last meal, especially since the teeth are in direct contact with the bone. A more detailed study of this association is apparently underway to determine how it may have arrived there and whether it truly indicates feeding behaviour. The discovery of Joaquin Raptor in the latest Cretaceous is also significant for our understanding of Megaraptor evolution. It suggests that giant Megaraptors likely survived right up until the end of the Cretaceous period. We previously suspected this based on the discovery of Maip macrothorax in 2022, a slightly geologically older Megaraptor found in Argentina that was also rather giant. But the discovery of the younger Joaquin Raptor confirms their presence at the end and indicates they were quite diverse. So while the latest Cretaceous of North America was the domain of T. rex, central and southern Patagonia belonged to these enormous giant arm megaraptors. An exciting prospect indeed. Hopefully more fossils of these fantastic animals will continue to be uncovered. Moving onwards, it's been one of those weeks in which it seems all the paleontologists in the world decide to publish their exciting discoveries at the same time, and so we've got five more new species of prehistoric animals to talk about. 
First up, a new species of Azdarkid pterosaur has been discovered in Brazil. The Azdarkids are the group of flying reptiles that include the largest animals to have ever taken to the skies, as far as we know. This new species lived right at the end of the Cretaceous period, around 66 million years ago. Named Galgadraco severius, it's known from a fragment of the upper jaw, and researchers identified it as a new species due to the arrangement of the openings in the bone and the anatomy of the groove along the palate. Galgadraco is the first pterosaur found in this specific geological group in southeastern Brazil, and it's also the first as dark it uncovered in the country. Interestingly, it appears to be closely related to a species known from the same period that is found in Romania, called Albadraco. Other indeterminate pieces of pterosaur material were also discovered at the Brazilian site, including a possible fragment of jaw from a hatchling as a darkid. So there is much more to learn about this ancient ecosystem and its pterosaur inhabitants. The second new pterosaur species of the week is from Germany. It's a much older species dating to the late Jurassic about 149 million years ago. Named Macrodactylus oligodontus, it should be noted that the genus name here is spelt with a K, as Macrodactylus with a C is the name of an insect, which makes it the second time a pterosaur name has been stolen by an insect, as fans of Titanopteryx know all too well. Anyway, the pterosaurian Macrodactylus is known from a nice partial skeleton including a complete skull and lower jaw, and it's an important species for studying pterosaur evolution. One of the major events in the evolution of these reptiles involved the transition from ramphorhynchoid to pterodactyloid forms, shifting from older long-tailed species to more recent ones with shortened tails, along with a range of other more derived anatomical features. Macrodactylus is a pterosaur that occupies a sort of in-between position, representing a grade of animals with features from both older and more recent pterosaurs. Several other pterosaurs from the late Jurassic of Germany belong to this grade as well. But Macrodactylus is smaller and also has unusually long teeth in its jaws. Another fascinating discovery. Moving from the prehistoric skies to the water, a new ichthyosaur species was also named last week. The ichthyosaurs, marine reptiles often discussed for their extraordinary convergence with modern dolphins, were a remarkably diverse lineage of aquatic animals that lived alongside the dinosaurs. This new ichthyosaur species belongs to an already named genus called Uranosaurus, an early Jurassic form characterised by an exceptionally long overbite, which gives these creatures the appearance of reptilian swordfish. Named Uranosaurus mistelgorgonsis, the new species is the youngest example of the genus so far discovered at approximately 180 million years old. It's represented by an almost complete semi-articulated skeleton with some three-dimensional preservation of the bones, allowing for a detailed analysis of the fossil that proved the species level differences in this specimen. Interestingly, the ribs of this ichthyosaur were significantly more robust and thickened compared to other Uranosaurus specimens hinting at something interesting going on with this younger species, potentially related to its diving habits. Another brilliant new species. Moving from the prehistoric seas and onto land, a new species of crocodiliform from the Cretaceous period has also recently been named. This is Thicarasuchus xenodentes, discovered in southwest Montana in rocks dating to around 95 million years ago. It's known from a decent amount of the skeleton, including an almost complete skull. This particular individual was a juvenile at the time of death, measuring just a couple of feet in total length or about 60 centimetres. The Karasuchus is a member of the same group that includes all living crocs, but unlike its modern relatives, this little reptile was much more terrestrial and probably fed on plants, insects and other small animals. The croc has what is known as a heterodont tooth condition, meaning its teeth were specialised in different regions of its mouth, similar to human dentitions but unlike modern crocs, which have broadly similar tooth shapes all along the jaw, so it was well adapted for a diverse diet. The Karasuchus also seems to have been preserved inside an ancient burrow, though it's not clear if it was living in there or just happened to get transported into one and buried. A very cute little prehistoric croc. 
For the last of the new prehistoric species named recently, we once again move from the land and back into the air as we welcome a new kind of prehistoric bird called Kumpengornis anhuimwesi. It comes from the early Cretaceous of China dating to between 121 and 113 million years ago. It's known from a mostly complete skeleton preserved on a slab and showing lots of lovely details on the bones. Incredibly, this little bird preserves the mashed up remains of fish bones within its abdominal cavity, presenting one of the oldest examples of a bird eating fish. Kumpengormus is a fairly close relative to the group that includes all living bird species, and it's now the fourth instance of this evolutionary grade of bird to be preserved with fish remains inside them. This therefore suggests that these prehistoric birds underwent an evolutionary radiation as several species adapted to feeding on aquatic prey during the Mesozoic era, long before the immediate ancestors of the living birds first appeared. An incredible discovery, showing just how diverse and adaptable these ancient birds were. We've got some more prehistoric news next, as a new paper has re-examined a particularly troublesome ancient hominid skull and revealed intriguing implications for the evolution of our species. The skull, called the Yangzhan II cranium, is approximately a million years old and was found in China. However, it is quite distorted due to the fossilization process. Now, researchers have used digital 3D scans to correct this distortion, revealing that the cranium exhibits a mixture of features that look both primitive and more derived. As such, the researchers find that it should be classified as an early member of the Homo longiclade, the group that also includes the Denisovan humans. Performing a new analysis of the evolutionary relationships of the longiclade to the Neanderthal clade and the Sapiens clade, which contains our species, they find that each lineage diverged more than one million years ago, significantly earlier than some previous studies suggested. Based on this analysis, it appears that our Sapiens clade originated around 1.02 million years ago. However, it should be noted that this does not necessarily mean Homo sapiens, as traditionally defined, existed that long ago. Species definitions are often pretty nebulous anyway, especially in human evolution. But it does indicate that the splits between the lineages leading to modern humans, Neanderthals and Denisovans extend pretty far back in time. Before we start the space news, we can't miss the fact that it's World Space Week this week. Space news has been a staple of seven days of science since the very first episode, and the stories we get from beyond our planet are some of the most exciting we get to report about. From massive steps taken in the technology of space travel, the launches and operation of new satellites, explorers and telescopes, and of course the possibility of life on other planets, space never fails to grab our attention. If you want to find out about the way World Space Week may be celebrated where you are, then check out the World Space Week website in the description. Space really is the final frontier, and we can't wait to have many more years of bringing you guys the latest in what's happening up there. Well, our space news this week is a story that, by coincidence, picks up from where we left off last week. We mentioned that ice being transported to Earth by impacts from other bodies may be a reason as to why there is so much water on Earth. And this week, a study published in the journal Science Advances has reconstructed the process of the formation of Earth, with their results supporting this idea. Large quantities of elements that are essential for life as we know it are not believed to have been found much at all on early Earth. These elements cannot condense this close to the Sun, so remain as separate gaseous forms. This new study used data from both meteorites and Earth rocks to demonstrate that just three million years after the formation of the solar system, Earth's chemical composition was already completely unsuited to host life. The authors posit that it was Theia, the planet that collided with Earth in its early days that brought water to our planet. They are presumably having been formed further out in the solar system. This collision is also thought to have created the moon. Perhaps we can find more evidence for this hypothesis in further studies of terrestrial lunar and other materials. 
And in other news, Huntington's disease has been successfully treated for the first time in gene therapy trials. Huntington's disease is a rare brain disorder that sees the production of mutant toxic proteins that poison the brain to cause symptoms that have been described as a combination of dementia, Parkinson's and motor neuron disease. The gene therapy company Unicure has seen a 75% slow in the disease after gene therapy over the course of a three-year period, a percentage described to the BBC by one researcher as spectacular. The procedure requires 12 to 18 hours of brain surgery where a harmless virus is infused into part of the brain through small holes made in the skull. This virus contains a genetic recipe for the body to stop producing the faulty proteins. By making neurons produce a small amount of microRNA that blocks the messenger RNA responsible for the production of mutant gene that produces these proteins. This treatment is incredibly expensive as well as needing such lengthy surgery, but the massive success of these trials means there is hope for people who know they are going to suffer from this condition. And perhaps one day this research could lead to cheaper alternatives as well. Finally for the news this week, a fascinating discovery has shed new light on the romantic relationships of leopard sharks, a species listed as endangered by the IUCN. After snorkeling with sharks every week for an entire year, a dedicated researcher witnessed a remarkable scene. One female and two male leopard sharks engaging in mating behaviour previously documented only in captivity. The researcher observed the trio for over a period of 90 minutes, which accumulated with both males copulating with the female, one after another. The first encounter lasted 63 seconds and the second 47 seconds. Once finished, the female swam away, leaving both exhausted males lying immobile on the sea floor. This rare event, captured by a boar reef, a marine reserve off the coast of New Caledonia in the South Pacific, suggests the site may serve as a critical mating habitat. This rare glimpse into the intimate lives of leopard sharks underscores the importance of marine reserves and highlights the urgent need for further research to better understand their reproductive ecology. These insights will be vital for developing effective conservation strategies to protect this endangered species. Well, that's it for the news this week. I really hope you enjoyed learning about everything that's happened in these last seven days of science. Be sure to email us at sevendos.stories at gmail.com if you'd have any research you'd like to see us cover or if you want to let us know how we can improve the show. You can also follow Seven Days of Science on Instagram and TikTok and also be sure to support us on Patreon if you enjoy what we do here. You can also follow me on Instagram as well. As always, a big thank you to our patrons, including Andrew Kawam, Sang Ying, Chippy Chippy Chapa Chapa, Clara Middleton, Dean A. Batha, Diana Hernandez, Drev Strivastara, Gariella, Gary Arrington, Giotist I Rage, Jeroen Zuidewick, John French, Joseph Reed, Joss Lambert, Corey Peterson, Lena Rose, Mark Nevin, Matt Grandis, Mendicant Fryer, Mike Pace, Monitor Man, Ralph Balzac, Robert Priapazika Jr., Robert Thomas, Sammy Patrika, Steve Bradshaw, Thomas F. Conroy III, Timothy and Ted Rowe, Tracy Merrifield, and Troy Schmidt. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you again next week.